Good day, grade 12s. Welcome to this next lesson in physical science. In this lesson, as I said to you yesterday, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be going through paper two questions, as you can see right here. They are from the Western Cape um, government prelim paper. And what we are going to do is today we are doing paper two um, in preparation for Monday. Then tomorrow and Thursday, we're going to do physics again in preparation for Friday. And then obviously on Friday, we're going to do chemistry again in preparation for Monday. So that is my plan. So today we are starting with going through a little bit of our paper two and our prelim paper two. We'll see how far we get with it. So obviously the paper two always starts with organic chemistry and it says consider the organic compounds represented by letters A to D below. So this year is obviously an alkane but it's quite sneaky. You can see there's a chlorine in here. So this is a halo alkane. B has got that Ku, that carboxylic C double bonded OOH, so that is an acid. This has got an O on the end, so that's an aldehyde. And this methyl propanoate is obviously an ester. So great tools when you get your reading time before you, and then you know you're not allowed to write obviously during the reading time, but during your reading time, I see so many students just sitting around, twiddling their thumbs, um, putting their head on their table and everything else. And it's so silly because it's such good time for you guys to read the paper. And during that paper, you can do exactly what we've I've just done. You can go through this and go, okay, fine. Now I've identified this. I know what is going on in my head. Let let me see if I can answer these questions, questions in my head before I even start the paper. It's quite nice to do that. Obviously, the first thing you want to do is go through all the paper, pieces of paper on them. Just get a general overview of the, quest, the exam. I know that some students prefer not to do that because it gives them a nervous breakdown uh, because they'll see, a, they'll, for some reason, they'll look at question four and realize that question four might be quite a scary question for them. And then because of that, they will freak out and not do so well in question one and two and three. So maybe some students don't like doing it. Then in that case, that's fine. But then use the 10 minutes reading time to, like I said, to go through this question one and decide what you're going to answer before you even start. OK, so it says explain why compound A is a saturated compound. You need to state that there are only single bonds and you need to state found between the carbon atoms. If you don't mention that it's between the carbon atoms as well, then they're not going to give you the, res the mark. So it has to be that you're stating that it is a single bond between the carbon atoms. Right. Now it says write down the IUPAC name of compound A. Okay, so here is a chlorine in here. So we know that this is a halo alkane because it's all single bonds. We also know that we need to choose the longest chain that includes this chlorine. So it's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, or it's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, or it's going to be one, two, three, four, five. So it's obviously six. And then we need to obviously count from the sides closest to the branch or to the functional group. In this case, the functional group is a chlorine. So it's going to be one, two, three, four, five, and six. So therefore, 42.1.2, the answer for compound A is it's obviously a hexane. This is a chloro because it's a haloalkane and it's found on carbon three. So it's three chlorohexane. There you go. Now they want us to write down the IUPAC name of compound C. Okay, so some of you might find it difficult to work out what compound C is without actually drawing it out. So let's do that. So it's C with three hydrogens then a carbon with two hydrogens, then a carbon with one hydrogen and a double bonded O. So the double bonded O is either an aldehyde or a ketone, but if it's found on the end 
the end of the chain, which it is in this case, then it's an aldehyde, okay? So this is an aldehyde. The name for it, it's actually got three carbons, that's prop, and the aldehydes in, end in anel. So instead of like um, alcohols, it's going to be anel. So this is propanel, propanel. Now it says name the homologous series to which car uh, compound B is. Remember we said that because it's got the C double bonded OOH, it has to be a carboxylic acid. A carboxylic acid. Please be careful of this, okay? If they ask you for the homologous series, don't give the name of the functional group. If they ask you for the name of the functional group, don't give the homologous series. And similarly with the names, okay? Now it says write down the IUPAC name of the alcohol needed to prepare compound D. Okay, so this is an ester made up of an alcohol and a carboxylic acid. The first part comes from the alcohol. So if this is a methyl, then this has to be methanol. methanol. Finally, it says write down the structural formula of a functional isomer of compound D. So the cool thing about compound D is that we can write it out and we can work out how many carbons and hydrogens and oxygens there are and then rearrange it, okay? So let's do that. It's compound D is a methyl. Then it's a propanoate, so it is O dash C double bonded O, dash, dash. These are all hydrogens. So how many carbons do we have? So you'll notice that it's got two oxygens. What else do we know about that is an organic compound that has two oxygens? The only other one is a carboxylic acid. And what you need to know is that esters and carboxylic acids are functional isomers of each other. Therefore, I can write this down as C dash C dash C double bonded O dash O dash H. One, two, three, four. That's going to be four. And then it's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Let's check it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh oh. Let me check it. Oh, there's my eighth one. There's a hydrogen. So, yes, I'm right. Each one of these stands for a hydrogen. Please, guys, when you are writing this out, do not do what I've done and not include your hydrogens, because if you don't include your hydrogens, you're going to get it incorrect. And notice it says structural formulas, so they want you to draw it out beautifully. Okay. Right, now it says, now this is quite sneaky. They've actually stuck a little bit of stoichiometry, stoichiometry into, into um, the questions on organic chemistry. So it's the first time I've actually seen that um, in a very long time. Usually they stick it in with acids and bases. So it's a very nice question. It says an ester contains 9,81% hydrogen, 58,85% carbon, and 31,34% oxygen. The molecular mass of the ester is 102 grams per mole. That says the alcohol used to prepare this ester is ethanol. What is the name of the other reagent used to prepare an ester? Um, It says the alcohol used to prepare this is ethanol. What is the name of the other reagent? So I can't work out what the other reagent will be unless they mean that it will be a carboxylic acid. Um, I cannot work out yet what the actual other reagent is other than... Unless they're talking about sulfuric acid, this is not a very good question. Um, 
It says, what is the name of the other reagent used to prepare the ester? It is a carboxylic acid. We also use sulfuric acid, but that's not really a reagent because it doesn't participate in the reaction. It only speeds it up and it removes the water. Um, I tell you what, let's work out what the molecular mass formula for the ester is, and then we can see what the carboxylic acid is. I think maybe these two questions were supposed to be rearranged. So let's look at it. We've got hydrogen, which makes up 9,81%. We've got carbon, which makes up 58,85%, and oxygen, which makes up 31,34%. Okay, now remember how you do this. You assume that we've got 100 grams of it. Therefore, the percentages are your grams. We're then going to divide by the molar mass to find the number of moles. So we can get a mole ratio. So this is 1, this is 12, and this is 16. So therefore, theoretically, the number of moles is going to be 9,81. And then we have to do, oh, sorry. Um, now look what I've done. There we go. So now we need to do 58.85 divided by 12, which works out to be 4,9. So that's 4,9 moles of carbon. And then oxygen is 31.5. 3, 4 divided by 16, because that's the molar mass of oxygen, and that's 1,96, 1,96. Now, in order to get a nice mole ratio, we always divide by the smallest number. So we're going to divide all of these by 1,96, 1,96, and 1,96. That's obviously 1. Now let's do this. So 4.9 divided by 1.96 is equal to 2.5. Two That's 2,5. And let's do this one. So you've got 9.8, oh, delete, 0.81 divided by 1.96. Equals five effectively. Right, but you can't have a half, so what we're going to do is double it up so it becomes two, five, and ten. So, therefore, as far as we're concerned, the ratio for this is C10H5O2. Okay, but now they've told us the molecular mass of the ester is 102 grams. So what we need to do is find out what, because this is the empirical formula. This is the basic ratio, which is C. For every 10 carbons, there's five hydrogen, hydrogens and two oxygens, okay? That is my basic ratio. But now I need to see what my actual ratio is, depending on the molecular mass. So we've got 10 carbons, so it's going to be 10 times by 12, plus 5 hydrogens, which is 5, plus 2 oxygens, which is 16. So 10 times by 12 is 120, plus 5, plus 2 times 16 is 32. It's interesting. Okay, so that becomes, what does that become? At 37, that's 157 grams per mole. Let me just check that I've done this correctly. It says 9,81, 58,85, and 31.34. I divided that by 1 for hydrogen, 12 for, and 16 for oxygen. Um, that becomes 9.81. Um, let me just check these numbers, shall we? So we got 58.85 divided by 12 is 4.9, I'm right, um, and then 1.96, let me check, 31.34 divided by 16, that's really not going to work, 
divided by 16 equals 1.96. So 1.96 divided by 1 is that. That's 2,5 and that is going to be about 5. That's right. So that is right. I think maybe they assumed that we were going to leave it as C5, H2,5 and one oxygen. If we do that, then do you agree, although that's not the fact what we should be doing, then do you agree we've got five times 12 plus two comma five plus 16, five times 12 is 60 plus two comma five plus 16. So that's going to be 78 comma five. So that's 78.5 grams per mole, okay, but now they've told us the molecular mass of the ester is 102. So we need to take 102 and divide it by 78,5. Now have you noticed that this isn't going to work? Watch here. 102, let's try again, 102 divided by 78.5 is going to be 1.3. So we're supposed to multiply this by 1.3. That doesn't work. Yeah, I think there's a problem with this question. Let's move on. Okay, it says, the relationship between the strength of intermolecular forces and the boiling point is investigated between four organic compounds. Butane, 2-methylbutane, pentane, and 2-methylpropen2-ol. Okay, that's interesting. So we've got the relationship between the strength of two intermolecular forces and the boiling point. Okay, the compounds and their boiling points are given in the table below. Okay, first I'll give you the definition of boiling point. And you need to know the official definition, but it goes something along the lines as the temperature at which um, a substance changes from a liquid to a gas. It says which substance will be a liquid at 50 degrees Celsius. So it has to be the 2-methylpropen-2-ol because its boiling point is above 50 degrees, okay? So therefore, it is still a liquid at 50 degrees because its boiling point is at 82 degrees. Now it says name the type of intermolecular forces between butane molecules, okay? Now, before, we used to get away with saying van der Waals forces. Now, they want, us to, they want us to say London forces. They want us to be more specific. So you can't just go write, saying, writing van der Waals forces. You have to say London forces. Now it says, refer to the strength of the intermolecular forces, the type of intermolecular forces, and all the structural molecules, and energy in order to explain the difference between the boiling points of the following pentane and 2-methylbutane. So do you agree that pentane, oh sorry, pentane, pentane, pentane. Um, do you agree that pentane and 2-methylbutane have exactly the same number of carbons? Okay, 2-methylbutane looks like this, one, two, three, four, with a methyl group. Pentane is just a chain of five carbons. So they have exactly the same number of carbons and exactly the same number of hydrogens. These are iso, um, isomers of each other. Okay, right. So now we have to look at the boiling points. Do you see that pentane has got a higher boiling point than 2-methylbutane? And the reason for this is the shorter chain. Okay, the shorter chain and the fact that this is branched. So you can say that both pentane and 2-methylbutane have got weak London forces between them, but pentane has a higher boiling point than 
to methylbutane because it has a longer straight chain and therefore it has got more London forces okay and the London forces are stronger because of the longer straight chain the other thing you could say is that 2 methylbutane is branched and therefore it has a greater surface area and therefore it's got a lower boiling point either of those two would work okay happy with that next they ask us about pentane and 2 methyl propyl 2 ol so they want us to compare these two and the most important thing you need to realize okay there are a couple of things the first thing is 2 methyl propyl 2 ol looks like this it's one two three with a carbon over here and then it's got an hydroxyl over here okay so first of all although it's got a shorter chain and it has a branching it still has a higher boiling point than pentane much higher and it's because of this hydroxyl group so you need to say that you need to say that even though it's got a shorter main chain it's only got three carbons in its main chain and it's branched it's got a carbon as a methyl group as a as a branching it is still I got a higher boiling point because of the strong hydrogen bonds okay which are much stronger than the weak lander forces and therefore this is going to have a higher boiling point okay happy with that next question says which substance will have the lowest vapor pressure now the lowest vapor pressure at 50 degrees celsius is the one that is going to be still liquid at 50 degrees celsius so it has to be the 2 methyl propyl 2 ol okay a sample of butane c4h10 of mass 26 grams burns in excess oxygen 34 grams of carbon dioxide is formed. The balanced equation for this reaction is given below. Okay, so it's very interesting because they're actually adding quite a lot of stoichiometry into this paper. So we've got 2C4H10. So if I were you, I would assume that since this is the government, Western Cape, government um, prelim paper, and they're adding quite a lot of stoichiometry, stoichiometry into this, that I would assume that your final paper is going to have some stoichiometry in it as well. So please be aware. Okay, the sample of butane is a mass of 26 grams, burns in excess oxygen, lots of oxygen. So therefore, this is the limiting reagent, right? 34 grams of this is formed. Okay, it says calculate the percentage by mass of pure butane calculate the percentage by mass of pure butane gas okay so what we really need to do is work out we were told that we got 34 grams of this so we need to work out how many moles this is because we never compare grams with grams right so we need to work that out so we know that number of moles is mass over molar mass right so the mass is 34 the molar mass is a mass of carbon, which is 12, plus 2 times 16, which is 32. So therefore, it's 34 over 44, which is going to be, let's work that out, 34 divided by, 40, divided by 44 equals and it's going to give me 34 over 44 oh, it didn't give me 17 0.77 so it's 0 comma 77 right so theoretically do you see that two moles of c4h10 gives me eight moles of co2 that's the theory okay therefore one mole of co2 needs 2 over 8, which is 1 quarter mole of C4H10. But we didn't even make 1 mole. We only made 0 0.77. So therefore, 0 0.77 moles of CO2 used up 0 0.25 times 0 0.77 moles of C4H10. 
we keep you understand. It's a quarter mil to one, but we ha don't have one. We've got 0 0.77, so we times both, both sides by 0 0.77. So let's work that out. So we've got 0 0.25 multiplied by 0 0.77. equals 0.19. So 0.19 moles of C4H10 was converted into that 34 grams of carbon dioxide. So now what we need to do is work out what that is in mass. Okay, so again, number of moles is mass of a molar mass, but this time we're working out the mass. So mass is number of moles times the molar mass, which is 0 0.19 times by 4 times 12 is 48 plus 10 is 58. All right, 4 times 12 is 48, yeah, it's 58. So let's get that on our calculator. So that's 0 0.1925, might as well just leave it like that, times by 58 equals 11,17. So out of this 26 grams, 11,17 grams actually was converted to carbon dioxide. So now that was a pure stuff, but they want the percentage. So it's going to be 11,17 over 26 times by 100 over 1. Okay, because that gives us percentage by mass, by mass of the pure butane. So let's go. We've got 11,165 divided by 26 equals, and then obviously to make it a percentage, we're going to multiply it by 100. 1, 0, 0 equals, and then press the SD button. 42.94%. Okay, that was not very pure at all. That is 42,94%. Not very pure at all. Interesting, hey? Right, now let's look at the next question. Okay, so again, we are doing organic chemistry. So do you see that even though, have a look at this, we've had Organic chemistry, okay, a little bit of weird stuff going on here. Then we've had organic chemistry, and yes, they're stacking some stoichiometry there. And we are doing organic chemistry again. So do you see that the first three long questions, you notice that I've ignored the multiple choice. The first three long questions are all organic chemistry. So obviously you need to be aware of the fact that organic chemistry plays a huge part in your final exams. Okay, now it says the flow diagram below shows different organic reactions. A and B represent different organic compounds. Okay, so we've got C12, in, in case you can't see this, this is C12H26 with reaction one forms, it looks like just ethene, okay. With reaction two goes to A. Then ethene plus water is reaction three, gives me a B, which then with reaction five gives me, this looks like CH3, CH2 bromine, and then back to reaction four, which gives me back to my ethene. Okay, so it says reaction one, write down the name of the type of elimination reaction that occurs in reaction one. So we're going from C12H26. So first of all, let's decide if that's an alkane, alkene, alkyne, okay? That is an alkane because the general formula for an alkane is CNH2N plus 2. So if this is 12, then 2 times 12 is 24 plus 2 is 26. So we've gone from a fairly big alkane to an alkene. That is cracking. The minute you're going from a big alkane to an, at least one alkene, you're going through cracking. Okay, now it says for reaction two, CH2CH2 undergoes a polymerization to form compound A. For this reaction, write down the type of polymerization and name, name of compound A. Okay, so we've got a C 
double bonded C H H H H and we're getting to a polymer. So you have to realize that there are two types of polymerization. The one is addition polymerization for which you need a double bonded compound and the other one is condensation polymerization where you need something that's got a dialcohol in it and a dicarboxylic acid. This year is addition polymerization. Why? Because we've got a double bond. Okay, and then remember that this year would be a basic unit for the polymerization. So this is ethene. So even though these double bonds break, the name of compound A is going to be polyethene. Like polyethene. Then it says write down the condensed structure of the monomer compound A. Okay, so this is actually fairly easy. All you do is break it up, okay, into what it would look like if we broke this up into a long chain. And just remember, you need to put a little bracket here and a little bracket here and go in, because that there is the basis of this huge compound. And this is the, but it's asked for the condensed structure. And here, I've done the structural formula. So the condensed structure is going to be C2, H2, and you still have to write your little N. Okay, so that is the condensed structure. Sneaky question. Right, now it says use structural formula to write a balanced chemical reaction for reaction three. So reaction three, what have we got? We got C, they want structural formula. C double bonded C, H, 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 H. And we are adding water. So if we're adding water, then obviously it's an addition reaction. And what's nice about this and this hydration is we're going to make it into an alcohol. So it becomes C-C, H, H, doesn't matter which one in this case because there are so many of them. I mean, there's only two hydrogens, I mean, two carbons, I'm going to get there. So therefore, we've gone from ethene to ethanol. Okay. Now it says write down the name of compound B. Well, I've just done it. It is ethanol. Next it says write down two reaction conditions which favor reaction four. Okay, so reaction four, we're going from ethanol back to ethene. So we're removing the water. So it needs to be an acidic reaction. In other words, it needs to have sulfuric acid to remove it. And it needs to be under reflux. Remember that? Okay, finally, it says consider reaction five. Reaction five. So reaction five, we're going from our ethanol and we end up with a bromine in it. So it says name the type of reaction occurring that can only be a substitution reaction. Substitution because we're replacing the hydroxyl group with a bromine. Okay, so state the reaction conditions for this. Sorry, this is the one that's under reflux. I apologize. This just has to be, have sulfuric acid in it and it has to be warm. It has to be hot. Okay, this is under reflux. And it said, except for bromoethane, given name of the other product that forms during this reaction, well, it's obviously water. Obviously water. Actually, I lie. It's going to be hydrogen bromide. No, hang on, I'm right. It is water. It is water. There we go. It's water. Because the hydroxyl grows and this joins, this is um, joining up with, a, this would have been plus HBr. Otherwise, we would have ended up with more bromines over here. So therefore, the hydroxyl groups joins up with the hydrogen to form water. Nice questions. Right, finally, out of organic chemistry and on to reaction rates. It says, a chemi chemist wishes to determine the rate of reaction of zinc with hydrochloric acid. The unbalanced, unbalanced equation this reaction is zinc plus hydrochloric acid gives you zinc chloride plus hydrogen. So that needs a two. 
Right, it says a piece of zinc is dropped into 0.1 cubic centimeter of 0.1 moles per decimeter cubed of hydrochloric acid, and the following data was obtained at four second intervals. Okay, so we've got 0, 4, 8, 12, 16, and you can see the mass of zinc is getting smaller and smaller up to the point where it remains the same. Firstly, it says calculate the average rate of the reaction for the first 12 seconds. So the average rate of the reaction is going to be the loss of mass over the time. Okay, so that's going to be 0, 0, 0.016 minus uh, 0, 0, 0.009, right, over the 12, because that's how much zinc was used up, right? Um, but this note is they've said calculate the average rate of reaction in moles per second, and this is grams. So I actually first have to work out the loss of mass in grams, grams, this is in grams, and then convert it to moles and then divide it by the time. Okay, so let's do that. So this, yeah, first let's work out what that is. That's 0, 0, 0.16 minus 0. 0, 0, 0, 9, 9 equals 0, 0.07. So that is equal to 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.07 grams. But they asked us for the average rate of reaction in moles per second. So what we need to do is divide this by the molar mass of zinc. So if you look at your formula sheet, your molar mass of zinc, I mean your periodic table, is 65. So we need to divide that by 65. So let's do that. Divide by 65 equals Phew. Okay, so that is going to be 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Okay, so that is 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 moles. Now we divide that by 12. Sure. So that becomes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So that becomes 8.97. So that's 9. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That is 9 times by 10 to negative 6 moles per second. Hmm. Okay. 9 times by 10 to negative 6 moles per Per second. Now it says, explain why the mass of zinc has remained constant after 16 seconds. The reaction has run to completion. It is finished. It is clear. Okay, there is no more zinc that is being changed into zinc chloride and hydrogen gas. That's it. The reaction has finished. Okay, now it says, explain how the rate of reaction changes as time passes. Answer only increases, decreases, or remains the same. It's obviously going to decrease, and you can even see that. Okay, yeah, the difference is 4. Okay, minus 4, but it's not common or 4, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, it is only 2, and that is 1, and that's 1. So the reaction rate is obviously decreasing, and the reason for this is because as the reaction continues, so there are fewer and fewer reactants available to have the reaction. Now it says, a graph that shows the amount of hydrogen gas that is produced against time for this reaction is shown. Done. It says redraw the graph and indicate on the same set of axes a second graph labeled Y that would be obtained if zinc powder of the same mass, same mass, instead of zinc granules were used. Okay, so let's think about this. Zinc powder is going to give you a greater rate of reaction. So it's going to happen faster. Okay, but the overall volume is going to be the same for the simple reason that we are using the same mass. So this reaction, which is going to be Y, is going to be up, but then it's going to be parallel. It's going to be equal. 
Oh, sorry. And this is why you use pencils to draw your graphs, okay? Um, it's going to be faster, but then it's going to be the same. That's supposed to be the same, okay? So that there is why. Now, the next graph they ask us is a third graph labeled X. Same volume of HCl with a lower concentration. So, same volume of HCl, lower concentration. The lower concentration is going to slow it down. And it says same volume. So, we're going to end up with the same amount in the end. So, it's going to be slower, but end up over here. So, that's going to be X. There you go. Okay. Now it says that we've ended the lesson. Okay, grade 12, we will continue with this on Friday. We'll continue working through this chemistry paper on Friday. Tomorrow and Thursday, we'll be doing physics in preparation for Friday. Have a great day.